In John 3, Nicodemus comes to Jesus at night. I think this detail matters. Is it secrecy? Is it courage? Why does he come at night? I think you can debate it either way, but I think it's secrecy because he's riddled with shame. I'll explain. Nicodemus is a man of the Pharisees, a proud member of the Torah-observing Jewish group who've assumed major leadership positions following the destruction of Jerusalem back during the Old Testament. His name means conqueror of the people. Scripture loves for the names of characters to have a connection with their plot lines. And so Nicodemus is said to be a ruler of the Jews, which puts him in the upper class, probably even a member of the judicial court known as the Sanhedrin. He's an unmistakably mature man. Yet he's coming to Jesus at night, in private, clouded with unknowing, desperate for truth, filled with shame. This is his dark night of the soul, and you can feel it in the text. You need to read the full chapter to appreciate the darkness of Nicodemus's night and the beauty of their back and forth. But I want to point you or point your attention first to the very end. Verse 21, Jesus is talking about people who are able to step into the light and the good deeds they do. And then we read this in 22. After this, Jesus and his disciples went into the Judean countryside. In other words, the scene ends. And we don't know what happens to Nicodemus. There's no resolution, no follow-up. The story just ends, and it makes us wonder, can he really let go of his shame? I say this is shame here because the context alludes to it. Nicodemus wants to know how Jesus is able to do what he does. And Jesus answers, and then Nicodemus questions it, and then Jesus answers again, and then he questions it again. And then Jesus concludes. That's the structure of John 3. Keep in mind that Jesus has already turned over the tables in the temple, turned water into wine at a wedding. He's healing and teaching and baptizing with his disciples too. Nicodemus is gobsmacked at what Jesus is doing, and you feel that pull that Jesus is having on Nicodemus's heart but he's just not quite ready to let it all go and to follow. Let's just read the text, and I think you'll see what I mean. I'll start in verse 11. This is Jesus speaking. Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testify to what we have seen, yet you do not receive our testimony. If I have told you about earthly things and you do not believe, how can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of the only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world, and people love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. Do you make the connection between light and dark? I mean, Jesus says those willing to step into the light will see the goodness of this world. But there are also others who don't step into the light because their deeds are evil. This is why I say Nicodemus is experiencing shame. He comes to Jesus at night, embattled about whether he can take what he's learning into the light. And his unceremonious exit feels like we get our answer. 
What a tragic tale of someone who wants to do good and find God and is clearly on a quest that is in search of deeper meaning and a brighter light. You can almost feel him wanting to take Jesus' message of grace and salvation and step into the light. But that would mean he would have to go up and against the power brokers and the stakeholders that helped him get to where he was. So he doesn't. Up to this point, all Nicodemus had to do was follow the law. Live by the law, teach others the law. It's all rule-oriented, outward-focused, piously critiqued. Everyone fits in a box. Everything fits neatly in that box if you just follow the law. And if it doesn't, he sits on the Judiciary Committee that decides what to do if it doesn't. But then comes Jesus, talking about being born again from above with the Spirit, shining a light in a dark world, and a God who loves the whole cosmos and is ushering in a kingdom of love and grace. It's mysterious. It's new. It's not old or rigid. It's available to all people on the margins, and the apex of power isn't the elite or the educated. Jesus is inaugurating a completely different paradigm. There is light and love and hope and grace, and it starts from the interior of our lives. Anyone can access it. It doesn't need overlords or religious elite. It's an inward transformation, a life change. Those who believe in me, he says, not those who just do the right things. It's an interior change that moves out into the world, changing systems and kingdoms by infusing their laws with love. This shift is colossal, and Nicodemus isn't ready to make it. So he walks away in the middle of the night, and we're left wondering, can he really let go of his shame?